Thank you. Um, I have no disclosures. So the consult for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis can be a very intimidating consult for us general surgeons. Um, and so therefore, we shouldn't be managing it alone. Ideally, it's going to be managed by a team of multidisciplinary specialists to include a gastroenterologist. However, despite improvement in medical treatment of IBD, we are sometimes still needed emergently or urgently for uh, our consultation and operative intervention. And these are the things that we're going to briefly touch on today. So there are many nuances to the management of IBD um, as far as medical therapy, and but it's important for the general surgeon to kind of understand the basic principles, especially in the acute care, acute management of the uh, of these disease process. So the first step is usually systemic steroids. This will induce remission in over 90% of patients, um, and you should see improvement within 48 to 72 hours. Um, the anti-TNF uh, agents are the biologic agents that are typically used in the acute setting, and you can start them at the same time as the steroids, or you can wait to see if they improve in that 48 to 72 hour range. If you don't see improvement in five to seven days, then uh, surgical intervention is usually required. So the, one of the more common consults that we'll get is for the acute colitis. So just to go over some definitions, severe colitis is defined as anything greater than six bloody bowel movements per day with the addition of increased ESR, anemia, and tachycardia, and uh, fevers. Toxic colitis is greater than 10 bloody bowel movements per day in addition to those things. In addition, they'll have abdominal distension as well as um, abdominal pain and distension. So again, you're going to want to start with the short trial medical management, and you want to rule out other infectious etiologies to include CMV and colitis. You want to discontinue any medications that uh, could slow down intestinal transit to include opioids and uh, loperamide. This could lead to progression of toxic megacolon. You also want to consider bowel rest and heavy antibiotics, and colonoscopy does play a role for prognostic indication. So indication for surgery, about 20 to 30% of these patients will require surgery. Perforation is associated with anywhere up to 50% mortality rate. So ideally, we want to catch these patients when they have signs of impending perforation. Signs will be a persistent or increasing clonic distension, pneumatosis coli, if they have local, uh, sorry, worsening local peritonitis, or if they have development of multiple organ failure. If patients clinically deteriorate while they're on medical therapy, you also want to surgically intervene at that time. Also, if they make it to that seven-day period and they haven't approved, you also want to intervene. So your operative procedure of choice is going to be a total abdominal colectomy with endoleostomy and heart main closure or mucus fistula. The goal of surgery is to rescue these patients from, their toxic, their, from the toxicity by removing as much of the colon as possible in the safest, most efficient way. So some considerations. Your distal point of transection is going to be the sigmoid colon at or near the level of the IMA. Um, this allows for quicker operative times, less complications, as well as an easier restorative operation if they require it. You want to leave the rectum in place and avoid all the complications that are associated with the pelvic dissection. However, you are going to be bringing your staple line, or sorry, your staple across a diseased piece of the rectum, so you are at risk of getting a staple line leak from that diseased bowel. Um, so you, to mitigate that risk, you could consider placing the uh, rectosigmoid stump in the extrafascial tissue, superficial tissue. You could also place pelvic drains and or leave an anal drain, transanal drain, to decompress the diseased rectum. The next consult you may receive is for bowel obstruction. The most common cause of bowel obstruction in the setting of IBD is a stricture. Um, you could also have adhesive disease, malignancy, fistula, or abscess as a course cause, but most of these will be caused by stricture. The causes of stricture can be due to inflammation, fibrostenosis, or um, a previous anastomosis. And it's important to kind of try and figure out what is the cause because um, this will help guide your, your therapy. To evaluate, you want to do CT scan with oral and IV contrast. You could also consider doing a CT or MR enterography. These can usually, uh, they're pretty sensitive and specific in determining if it is inflammation or stenosis as a source of the stricture. So again, your first-line therapy is going to be medical management, and most of the time this will work, and that'll be NG decompression, uh, fluid resuscitation, and IV corticosteroids. And with inflammatory strictures, this is most of the time successful. However, it will not be successful if it's a fibrotic stricture. You may consider endoscopic balloon dilation. Um, that's if it's located, the stricture is located in an accessible part of the bowel, if it's a short segment, and if um, there's no signs of active inflammation in that area. And asthmatic strictures do respond well to um, balloon dilation, and they are successful in like over 80% of the time. However, if medical and or endoscopic therapy isn't successful, then surgical resection is necessary, with your primary goal being to 
minimize the amount of bowel that's removed. Because of the rate of recurrence, about 45% of patients will require another surgery in 10 years. Other kind of considerations is sometimes patients with Crohn's disease will get proximal strictures at the duo or the stomach. In this case, it might not be amenable to a resection or a strictureplasty, and a bypass might be necessary. For colonic strictures, um, you want to make sure you're in the setting of growth with Crohn's and you see you want to thoroughly biopsy and always kind of have in your mind that it could be a malignancy and therefore perform an oncologic resection. Perforation. Um, is, as we discussed, uh, something that's rare but can ca happen due to either obstruction or the toxic colitis. Again, the presenting symptoms can be masked by steroids, so you have to have a very low, uh, high clinical suspicion when a patient deteriorates when they're on immunomodulating therapy. Treatment is going to be resuscitation and emergent surgery. For small bowel, that means for section with anastomosis, and colon usually requires a subtotal colectomy with endoleostomy. An abdominal abscess is a, another consult you may get for Crohn's disease that can be caused by either a contained perforation or a penetrating ulcer. The initial management is going to be fluid resuscitation, broad spectrum antibiotics, bowel rest, you want to consider using TPN. And then depending on where and how big the abscess is, you could give thought to percutaneous drainage. Usually if it's greater than three centimeters, you should try and drain it. Over 70% of the time, this will be successful. And more importantly, even though about 30% of those patients will require a surgery within a year. It bridges and converts it from an emergent surgery to an elective surgery with far less complications. However, if emergent surgery is required in an unstable patient in the setting of an abscess, you will, we prefer resection over drainage. A fistula is also something caused by Crohn's disease. Um, this situation, most do not require urgent or emergent surgery. The first thing you want to do is determine if the patient's septic. If they are, you get a CT scan looking for an uncontrolled source of the sepsis, which will hopefully be amenable to percutaneous drainage. Um, if they do have ongoing sepsis, which again is pretty rare, then you do need to go ahead and resect. In the non-septic patient, which is what the majority of these patients will present as, the things you need to consider, especially if it's a high, put, high output fistula or if a large piece segment of bowel is being bypassed, they can get dehydrated, have... Um, be malnourished. So you want to make sure you optimize their nutrition, optimize their hydration, correct any electrolyte imbalances, and then um, at that point, they're ready for surgery. The key is that this usually takes weeks to months, so it's not something you need to do right away. Acute hemorrhage is extremely rare in the setting of UC and uh, Crohn's disease. Medical management is usually successful. You could also consider IR or endoscopic treatment. Only in the hemodynamically unstable patient is surgery required. So a couple intraoperative considerations. Um, one of the big questions always when you're operating on IBD is do you divert or not divert? Um, unfortunately, there is no good answer. You just got to consider each patient individually. Specifically, looking at their nutritional status, um, an albumin of less than 3.5 has been shown to increase anastomotic complications in elective colon surgery, um, and that literature has been replicated in IBD setting as well. You also want to consider the dosage and chronicity of immunosuppressive medications. Um, so the literature still has it. We haven't really agreed on what, how much of a role they play in causing abdominal sepsis or anastomotic complications. However, we do. It is universally agreed upon that they play some role. So you just it's something you need to consider. And you also want to consider some intraoperative factors, such as the patient's hemodynamic stability, the degree of intra-abdominal contamination, the extent of disease burden, and also the extent of wall edema. Another question is, how much do I resect? Um, so again, your goal is to perform a limited resection with your goal of about two centimeters of gross negative margins. Literature has shown that even if you have microscopic Crohn's disease at your anastomosis, it doesn't increase your risk of uh, recurrence at that site. So basically, you're looking for inflamed bowel, a creeping fat, and the thickness of the mesentery. But one thing in particular you could do is it's called the finger and uh, thumb to index test. You basically palpate the mesentery at the base of the bowel, and you're feeling for thinner mesentery and uh, soft bowel. And finally, what is the role of laparoscopy in these patients? So basically, the benefits of laparoscopic approach that we found in regular col uh, elective colorectal surg surgery has also applied to that in IBD, in that there's early return of bowel function, shorter length of hospital stay, significant lower um, overall morbidity, and there has been uh, no increase in recurrence in these patients, open versus laparoscopic. As far as its utilization in the setting of like acute, colitis, acute severe or toxic colitis, I think that's really based on the surgeon's expertise as well as patient selection. Thank you.